David Jelling and my wife's name Erica. Uh, we have been leading the church there for about 25 years. So it's, wow. a, it's been a long time. We're about 100 now, and I think you have many people you do know there at Thomas and Jillian yeah. uh, there and having a fantastic time. They, they travel a little bit because I think they're a little more allergic to the cold than they think. It's a little bit colder uh, than Hamilton. But uh, it's such a privilege to be here uh, in Hamilton, just to be able to share some thoughts. But I do want to send a greeting um, from a couple you know very well. Uh, so I don't know if you can just turn that to the next slide. Okay, so I don't know if you, uh, like I want to, I mean, I do, it's interesting because I think, well, your family's here. Why wouldn't they be introducing you? Uh, but there's a lot I want you to do in your slideshow. But Ronnie, um, you know, it's, it's Ronnie's brother and, and sister-in-law. But as you know, it's Tim and Anna Petter. And then you see, uh, there's, I don't know what Violet's doing with her face there, but something. But uh, that, uh, that new tiny little creature was born on the 28th um, at uh, you know, 11, it was in the morning, so it was good in a birthing center. So 11.54 a.m. So that, that, that's a good, you know, kids want to be born at like 2 a.m. and you're about to sleep. And it's also uh, nine pounds, uh, five ounces, nine, 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 what was it, five, yeah, nine pounds, five and point nine ounces. So not small, not big, but, but, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that she felt it, yeah, yeah. So having never been pregnant, I, I'm pretty angry. Right? It's not big, it's not big, anything is big. So I was like, all right, I mean, it's fine. It sounds great. Uh, but. Yeah, they send greetings, and uh, they're just so excited to have, um, you know, once again, no sleep, enjoying, uh, yeah. uh, you know, no time together. But yeah, they're so excited to have that. Uh, we we uh, are very so excited to have Tim and Anna uh, with us. Uh, they lead what we call, they call it. I, I didn't like the name. It's called the Yam Fam. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a, a sweet potato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what it stands for is the Young Adults Ministry, and so right. I was like. Whatever, if that's what you want to call it. But uh, yeah, but they've been such an amazing job. That ministry's grown. It's about 20, 25 wow. young adults, 30 and under. So it's both married and singles people, including the campus. It's just a great time. They're taking a little bit of time off for Matt and Pat leave. Uh, but generally, so Eric and I, we've been working with that ministry, but it's just a a vibrant ministry with yet another tiny little person that's also under 30. Yeah, yeah. But they speak a whole lot. Uh, but yet, it's, uh, it's a fantastic blessing to have them. And so, once again, uh, thank you, Ronnie, for all your sharing. Oh, where'd you go? Do you want to get oh, please, uh, well, if you see that, thank you for your sharing. Thank you, the whole, I think, as Jeff said, we were witness front, uh, you know, front row center to some of that development and evolving, for sure. Uh, today, I have a, a message for you to share about uh, encounter series yes. and the thread series that go along awesome. with that. I think you're familiar with that. Yep. I, I don't I, I don't think I need to introduce huge parts of it. But for those who are visiting with us and for the watching later online, as a, as a Canadian family of churches, uh, we're a group of 11 churches, and we partnered with the Disciple Center for Education. And um, we had a lot of customization with the material to create encounter. Um, and that's a, a quiet time series where we're hoping to re-engage and reignite our relationship with God um, through just getting time and devotionals, focus times together, but also working together as well. But also as a follow-up to that, uh, there was a Thread podcast series. And so that drops pretty much every week and there's daily quiet times. And in a way you can go through whatever speed you wanna go through, but there's always a starting point. And it, we're gonna literally in the next three years, or we're gonna go through the entire uh, Bible that talks about humankind and connection with God. And so if you want to start, don't, don't be free to, ah, oh, you know, it's, uh, they were already started. It's not like certain movies where, like, Lost, the movie, the, the show, the movie, if you jump in, you're like, I'm lost, I have no idea what's going on, right? Like, isn't that person dead? Or, yeah, yeah. Is that a dream? Like, no, you can jump in pretty much anywhere, you can start anywhere, and you don't have to, okay, I'm going to have eight quiet times a day to catch up with it. You don't have to do that. So wherever you're at, you can catch up with that. And so part of that involves just kind of seeing God's tapestry. And you'll see, like, you know, you see that little the little badge up there. I don't know if you've gotten a badge as a Boy Scout or Girl Scout or whatever. But a little badge turning the starting point. And one of the brothers, he's kind of an outdoors enthusiast. And so yeah. the whole thing's framed around, like, a, a hiking journey, um, mountains. We don't have a lot of mountains, so we just pretend they're there. We, we, we think of Calgary, and that's where the mountains are. But that's where your starting journey is. And then you kind of hike along, you find, like, what do you bring in your backpack? But interestingly enough, you may have this beautiful badge in the front, but behind that badge, if anybody's any, done crocheting or all that, it's really messy in the back. Okay. And so I think in many ways that's God's 
you know, way of telling us in the world that, you know, every life that seems a certain way, yeah. it's, it's, there's a lot of funky bits in the back. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think as Ronnie shared and other people shared, you have your own testimony, you know, the things that look great in the front and the back, it took a lot of work to get there. Yeah. So everybody who's a disciple today, you made it through, you're a miracle, believe it or not. Because yeah. when they see the back of your life, you're yeah. like, okay, you know, yeah. and God was working through uh, the tapestry of it all, for sure. So you can give your hand, you give God a round of applause yeah. for, for yourself to, uh, to know that, that uh, God's working. Yeah. So today, as we continue with the series, we get to a, a, quite a topic. Um, it's the flood, right? And so I don't know what you think of when you think of the flood. Uh, a lot of times with the kingdom kids, um, they're like, yeah, it's the flood. We got a bunch of animals and, and, and Noah. It's fantastic. Without realizing... There's a whole B-side to that movie yeah, yeah. Uh, that nobody really sees behind what's happening. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of scholarly debate. Is what, Was it a worldwide deluge or flood? Every major religion has some type or even narrative story, has some type of deluge or flood story. From the Assyrians, the Sumerians, the Chinese, the Greeks, have some type of flood story. And so it's not a denial of, of, of whether a deluge happened, okay? But it's what the scope was, what, where did it happen, but something happened about, you know, and the timing's all over the place too, but something happened, and when God put the flood story together, he didn't just do it to give scientific facts, and there wasn't like dates and time, and GPS locations, and how high it was, and, and of course, as you know, as you've been going through this series, the Bible sometimes uses poetic language, when it says all the world, like does that mean you know, this tiny little space behind the backwoods of a little town in it, you know, outside of Hamilton, is that what it means? No, it's hyperbole. Often it means what they could see, how big it was, it was scope, and it just meant it touched everybody that was reading it somewhere. Okay, and so we don't want to, because the Bible's written not like a scientific book where in terms of day one, day two, day, you know, there's general genera generalities, you know, because when you read a poem, you know, uh, you know, love is like a, a web, <laughs> no. You'll think, oh, what? I don't know. That's stinky. That's gross. You know, and there's a spider in the middle waiting to eat me? Like, no. Nobody's going to believe that. You understand what it means. You can get tangled up into it. And sometimes you want to be tangled. Sometimes you don't want to be tangled. Sometimes you're like, wow, whatever it is. So when you read the Bible, when you understand the flood, there's things that we want to be able to pull out of it as opposed to, you know, the, the kinds of things that went into the ark. How big was the ark? You know, that... Do they use chainsaws? Like, well, like all these, these are all the wrong questions, right? And so as I, um, we've been sharing this series, multiple preachers in Winnipeg, they, 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 we're doing this. We share some principles, hopefully I can share with you today, that can help you maybe navigate some of the big Bible language. And we can't cover everything about the flood. Mm -hmm. Some people have done their doctorates in studying even aspects of the flood. Wow. And so there's a lot of work. You go dig deeper and deeper and deeper. Because when the Bible becomes boring to us, believe me, it's nothing to do with the Bible. It's our heart. Right. That's what it is, right? Yeah. And so if we can turn to the next slide, this is something I invite you to, to think about. Whenever you see a passage in the Bible, there's some type of principle that comes with it. Sometimes the principle is right on top. Like, don't steal. Oh, I wonder what it means. <laughs> it's, clearly, if it's not yours, and no one's giving you permission, don't take it and put it in your bag. Like it's super clear, right? That's a principle. But sometimes it's a little more hidden. You know, like, like you know, don't, don't, don't take a person's donkey. You're like, oh, okay, well, they don't have a donkey, but can I take their laptop? Like, like it doesn't say that clearly, but the principle's a little more hidden, but you can figure that out. You took my donkey, you took my laptop, I, I'm, I'm not gonna like that. I don't own a donkey, but I certainly understand the principle behind it. And so when you see the passage and the principle behind it, the next thing you wanna be able to do is make it personal. Because if you can't make it personal, then what happens is it just dies in your brain. And this is what I mean, okay? Everybody here knows, unless you just don't use money or you don't live in the world, you know how debt works, don't you? You have this much money, income, whatever, and you spend this much money, okay? You see? That space in between is debt, okay? No one's going to stand here going, what? No one taught me that. Is that what's happening to me? Because, yeah, everyone kind of knows that. You figured that as a kid, right? You keep eating your Oreos. Where do Oreos go? 
They're inside. They've been transferred over, right? And so people are starting to spend in December. And then in January, they like, what is going on with this visa bill? Well, it's your name on there. You got a bunch of stuff. But if you don't pay them, visa calls you up. Hey, we were there for you. I need you to be there for us, right? Like paying us back. We all know this, okay? But here's the thing. What if we know this information and we just ignore it? Like gravity, for example. Yeah, whatever. You know, it's some of those, those ideas. It's not that high, right? Those are famous last words before we go to the hospital, right? There's so much we understand. And what it does, sometimes the Bible, it, it, we feel like it's a thinking thing. And so we're more thinking creatures. That if I change your mind, if the Bible changes your mind, it will change your life. Yeah. That's just not true. No. That's not true. Okay. You know, Descartes said this uh, uh, amazing thing, and it, it really fooled the world. It's cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. That's not necessarily true. Because I think many things. Yeah. <laughs> I know many things. But when it comes down to it, not doing that. Yeah, Why yeah. is that? I think that's wet paint because it says wet paint. Somehow, well, let me check. And, like, and then I'm shocked why my fingers are covered in paint. Do you see the discrepancy between what I know and what I do? Right? Do you see what I mean? Should I eat that 15th donut? Right? And should it make sense? They just won't be little oh, tiny ones. Not the big ones, right? And so we start thinking about this. After you've been a disciple for a while, you kind of know enough about the Bible, that even if you didn't have the Bible with you, right. you kind of know, know that is hardcore wrong. Right. Like, you know it. But you know what, though? But you don't understand, David. Yeah. You don't understand who that person is. I go, well, oh, I understand. They're kind of like, they're kind of a, of a jerk, and they sinned against you. I get it. So what you did, you know it's wrong, but you don't understand. See, we're not arguing whether we know it's right. We're <laughs> arguing why we did it. Yeah, this right. is two different arguments. Right. So as we take the passage and the principle, making it personal involves... How do I not think about it, but what do I show what I want? Okay, you'll see this in the passages in the Bible. What I think about the passage and what I want is revealed in my schedule and revealed in what I get angry over, what I get upset about, what I get excited about. Because I know a lot of people, they really, really think about being married. They think about being in love. But what they want they don't really want to be, they, they, don't, they don't want to do the work of marriage, yeah. right? Somebody says this, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? And you go, well, okay, how does that work, right? I mean, you pull the Elijah thing and just drag on it. That doesn't happen a lot. Only one time I heard, right? And so we started thinking about the passage and the principle of the flood, and we get it personal. So what is, how does this apply to my life and expose what I really want, not just what I think? And also, how do we make that practical? Because it's really cool without any steps to it. Because it's a lot easier to watch a marathon, yeah. to watch a hockey team. You should go faster. You get on an ice, you like, stop yelling at me. Right, right. Because people are trying to hit me, and I can't. It's, I always play football and hockey in my head. It's a lot easier, right? And then people run by, hey, good job with the marathon. Awesome. And they're like, why don't you get on? Like, before I criticize all these folks, Practically, what does that look like for me to do that, yeah. right? You know, I'm part of a, a small gym. It's not that small. It's actually worldwide. It's called Planet Fitness. People start judging. What Planet Fitness? Planet Fitness. Do you know they make more than half their revenue? People who pay and don't go. They just want to give free money away. I don't think so. They keep it nice and cheap. And I'm, I'm, I'll say I'm the black card member. Twenty four ninety nine a month. Right? You know, I'm stuck. Just other gyms. It costs like. Hundreds of dollars a week, right? I get it. But why do they do that? Because they know how people do things. Yeah, so they know you think you want to exercise, right? And you'll pay for it and you'll feel good. Because, oh no, it's been two years in a row I haven't gone. You're like, what's happened? You know what, though? Because I'm paying, I know I'm going to go. That is ridiculous. Yeah? And they even advertise it. And you still pay. Why do you do that? Because what's passage in principle and personal doesn't translate to the practical. Mm -hmm. Well, think about the Bible, and we took this from one of the brothers um, in Winnipeg. 
It's really cool to read the scriptures and do nothing about it and feel really great about it. It's the same thing as thinking about the gym, having a gym membership, having the fancy clothes, but never working out. Right. Or watching someone else work out for you. Because right. when you watch a workout video, it feels great. Mm. Except, you know, you're eating your nachos, but wow. <laughs> that looks really hard. It is so amazing. So, here are some things I want to talk about. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide, please. <laughs> I can't read the whole flood account. I can, but it'll take a while, all right? But there's some passages in the Bible that highlight this flood that's a little different than the Kingdom Kids version. Because when you see it, somehow they get this really cool art, all the happy animals, and, and you know, all, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you what it, what it really looked like. Right. My brother used to work as a cop, and they oftentimes would find... Um, people that had died and they would be in the river. We have massive river systems there. When the body sits here for a while, you don't want to do that. We have another brother who used to be a diver. He'd be a forensic diver. He dived down there. They were looking for bodies. It's just not the funnest job because you're swimming through and you're like, oh no, there's a body. But you're also swimming in the water that the body was in. And fish and all that. It's a disgusting thing for one body. The same brother would also go uh, help farmers find their cows that had drowned because you can't leave. I know, what a job, right? Got paid good money for it, but of course, you know, it was kind of gross, right? But can you imagine what that would have looked like if it rained even for part of the world? Where thousands of thousands of creatures that couldn't swim, breathe underwater, human beings would be floating outside. What do you think that would have looked like? And smelled like. Let me tell you, that would not be in the Kingdom of Kids. Message. Here, look, here's coloring here. Look at all the body. Like, you're like, no one's gonna do that because you'd be kicked out of Kingdom of Kids. But what happens? We sanitize the Bible, the flood that killed everybody with no bodies. Nothing that smelled. Right? All the little muskrats and all the, all the things. I mean, the birds are okay for a little bit, but there's a point that, like, you know, I can't fly anymore. I'm done, right? And the ducks are okay. There's something like, wow, there's all these bodies everywhere. I think um, the fish of the sea had a grand old time going, what? This is awesome. This is like the biggest aquarium. We can just eat food like all the time. What a disgusting, disgusting thing. Do you ever see, if that's, if that's not your first thought when it comes to the flood, then what it is, is that we relegated the crucifixion to this really, really cool decorated cross. It goes across on my neck with, oh my goodness, it's a cross. Would you ever think about hanging an electric chair there? Right, right. Really? No, well, that's sick. That's an instrument of death. What do you think the cross was? Right. It's not some cool tattoo you get. Yeah. It, 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 I feel Christian today. Yeah. When you look at the flood, when we don't understand and we don't really absorb that practical mm -hmm. principle and, and, and the whole personal side of it, it becomes a sanitized idea mm -hmm. of what sin can do. And so the Bible says that this flood thing just didn't happen. Okay? It, it just didn't suddenly go, oh man, it started raining and it didn't stop. What happened? God had a reason for it. Right. And oftentimes when we devoid the reason for what something happened, guess what happens? We get mad. We don't understand. Because we are having 10 pieces to a 100 piece puzzle and we think we know what it looks like. This is God's heart behind whoever wrote Genesis. It says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And once again, there's a lot of loaded words. Once again, every. What does every mean? It doesn't mean every thought I'm thinking about cooking rice and evil. No, no, we're not putting that. What it is, is saying that the majorly overwhelming piece of their desire, not what they say, was a rebellion against God. Because when we think evil, we think serial killers, arsonists, rapists, murders. That's not what he's talking about. Because evil is not defined by those extreme things. Evil has to do with rebellion against God. Yeah. You know, the reason why we're here, I mean, we love Hamilton. It's because our, our, our but, but we're here because our son got married yesterday. It was yeah. an amazing, amazing yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing to see a disciple's wedding. The best man was our, our youngest son. Just so amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people were just so excited about, um, you know, it was a lot of tears. Amazing time. We're a little bit tired uh, from that yesterday. Lots of sharing, lots of food and fun. But, but I'll tell you, when we think of evil, we don't think of a rebellion against God when people are doing things at a wedding that displeases God.
because there was no murdering and serial killing yesterday. I mean, that's not part of the program. Like, our wedding planner didn't do that. But there was things done. Jealousy. Worldliness. Impurities. All kinds of stuff everywhere. And then you were like, well, at a wedding? Well, why would you bring that in? I don't bring it in. People bring it in. Right? right? People did a lot of things that, you know, I, th there was a time where people drank. I mean, not all of them were disciples. Even some of the disciples. I'm like, that's a lot of alcohol yeah. that, that is available, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the alcohol. It's, it's, you know, did somebody slam that into your mouth? Is that what happened, right? <laughs> yeah. But I tell you, nobody's going to sit through that and say, you know what? That was an evil time. I think there was evil and there was good in everything we do. Now, I know that might be shocking, but even in church. What? Come here. Yeah. I know. Yeah. You see somebody, you're like, oh. Come on, Dave. Amen. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> That's evil. That's not evil, David. I didn't kill them. Yeah, I know, but you thought about it. Mm -hmm. and you're like, what do you mean I thought about it? When you're angry with your brother, your yeah. sister, you're not at peace. There's right. something wrong. Yeah. And so you start redefining what evil is. Mm -hmm. Because when we start seeing this lesson from history of the flood, mm -hmm. start thinking about my life. Your life. How does evil get redefined? Because I'm going to redefine evil the way I want it so it's comfortable. Right. Only these yeah. people are evil and the rest, yeah, they're okay, they're ishy, we can make it work. It's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Because if you think of an ICU, would you want it ishy cleaned? Mm -hmm. uh, intensive care unit. You have anything in there, the person's in there for a reason, right? Yeah. Anything goes wrong, <laughs> they go. They die. Because it's contaminated. And that's why God is holy, holy, holy. So evil has to do with it not being holy. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with just, I mean, sure, serial killers, Hitler, all their, I get it. What's happening around the world, the violence, I get it. Mm -hmm. But what God talks about is there's a point in time, this little bit of evil that soaks in us, it starts to grow, yeah. you know, right? Nothing starts off monstrous, it starts yeah. off little. Mm -hmm. And the next pe passage, he describes the next passage. <laughs> Thank you so much. These are the highlighted words. He was thinking of that manifestation of evil. It slowly, over time, hundreds of years, it started to develop into words that he started to say. He called it corrupt and violent. Wow. I want you to think about that for a second in the world that we live in. So I'm going to read a passage from Genesis 6:11. I want you to picture this passage, thinking of the world that they were describing, but also thinking of the world we're describing. See if they match. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how, how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Right? Yeah, that's going on in, in Hamas and in Russia and all these terrible places you've been shedding. Not here in Hamilton, Canada. What? what? It's not happening in Canada. Yes, it is. On, it's happening everywhere, that corruption piece. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you hear about shifting of monies. Um, you know, I, 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 in my second career, I worked a lot with indigenous communities. You ask an average indigenous person, like, a, you know, the native community, ask them if they feel that there's corruption in leadership. There's corruption. Yeah. We in Winnipeg, um, with the, um, you know, the, the partnership of the Catholic Church, with the Anglican Church and the, the government in the 60s, they, 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 they had something called the 60s scoop. And what the 60s scoop was, the government and the, 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 organiza the church organizations decided that the native peoples cannot raise their own kids. And so they used uh, the RCMP, the yeah. military, and cops, dragged kids away, they were five and older, and dragged them into church orphanages and all these different places. And if you don't know about that history, it's a big thing. It's called the Truth and Reconciliation, yeah. right? Huge things like that. Yeah. You know, and, and in many ways, it, this is not some social dust and commentary. It, I mean, it's part of it. But Canada, with its pristine maple leaf, you know, and, you know, we live with such a peaceful. You ask the average person that come from that community, there, they were subjected to sexual, emotional, violent abuse at the hands of quote unquote Christians. And so that's why a lot of these folks are like, oh, Christianity, get away from me. Right. When the Christianity that they practiced resembles what the world would have practiced, it's the same thing. Yeah. When you see this, right, even to this day, you look around your neighborhoods, there's so much corruption and violence everywhere. Yeah. And meanwhile, you know, I, well, 
If I lock myself away and I Netflix it a little bit, it'll go away. So it's kind of like, you know, like Violet when she was playing hide and seek, she would just go, I'm gone! You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. just because you can't see it, can you? We can still see you! Right. She's going to have to figure that out. Yeah. Okay, a little bit. But we as disciples, when we don't think that this parallels our world, then we're going to have a real problem with the flood. Yeah. A real problem with God's justice, because we just don't realize it. Think about your business, your homes, your community. What do you see? You know things aren't right. You see, it. <coughs> I don't have to do much. Turn on the news. The news will do the sermon oh, for me. Yeah, yeah. Turn it on. You'll see. Yeah. Now it's more like, you know, it's not about a school shooting, a active shooter. It's more like, well, wow. how many people did they kill? Mm. It's crazy. I was in a conference down in Florida. And um, there was a shooting just a mile from where we were. Uh -oh. Five or six people got shot. Uh -oh. And then, you know, but even in the conference, I said, are we not going to mention that? And the person asked, well, did anyone die? And I went, no. They're like, eh, what are you going to do? It just happens. Do you remember the first time that happened yeah. 20, 30 years ago? And everyone's just like, yeah. and I was like, eh, what are you going to do? Yeah. And then we call it, well, that's just Americans. That's what happens in Canada, too? Well, that's just the big cities. Then it happened to little cities. Uh, well, it's just like, that's outside my house, right? Yeah. It's happened in my house. Well, that didn't happen in my bedroom, though. Like, we get smaller and smaller places. Come on, David. So God saw this. What's a father supposed to do? What's he going to do? Right. See, the amazing thing is we can get duped into thinking, nah, we're not in those times. Mm -hmm. So I want to turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Well, Great stuff, Dave. Great. This is so powerful because this describes what people were doing when the underbelly of the corruption and the underbelly of the evil was there. Listen to this. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. This is our days now. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the days of Noah, entering the ark. The flood came and destroyed them all. Mm -hmm. I want you to just, this passage is so scary. It is. Yeah. You know why it's so scary? That's what we were doing yesterday. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of them are going to have lunch after, unless you have a fast, good for you. <laughs> you're going to be eating, drinking, you're going to be hanging out, whatever, doing your thing, yeah. right? You go to church, you're doing your thing. And no one had a clue. Mm. They were going about their business. Because wow. what had happened was they were ignorant of the reality of judgment. Mm. They were enjoying themselves. They felt so secure in their position. Can you imagine the entire church feeling that way? Oh, we're gay. We're in here. We're in church. What can happen to us in church? Lots of stuff can happen in church. I'm praying with my wife. I'm doing all kinds of cool stuff. But this happened in the middle of a regular day. But that regular day was tainted by corruption and evil. And people forgot to see it. The cool thing was they called Noah a preacher of righteousness. You know what that means? You, want to, you don't think you'd tell your friends, hey, you know, I know this can sound a little bit wacky. But, you know, I, 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 God told me, okay, to build an ark. Because yeah. he's going to... Rain and flood this place up. Mm. Mm, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Drinking a little bit, right? You know? Uh, you sure? <clears throat> right? You've been drinking? Like, are you sure, Noah? You, are, you, are, you, are you sure about that? And they didn't believe him. Yeah. How do I know? Because yeah. I bet you had a lot of believers. Like, you know, can you imagine? Start regulating. It's, it's not going to happen. Oh, whatever. It's not gonna... You know, but how long would it take for you to go, good what? That's a lot of water. Could it be that crazy old man? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. Get some more drinks. Another round for the house. We'll do that. My son's getting married tomorrow. We're not going to do that. And it kept raining, and there's a point. It may have started with a small flashpoint with the wives. They're like, you know, I'm just going to head up that way. Yeah. Where, where are you going? Just, yeah, I'm going to go. Why got a bunch of stuff with you? Don't worry about it. And now, because I don't want to tell people where I'm going, because I might seem crazy. But also, maybe I just realized that boat ain't that big. We start heading up. Can you imagine getting there finally and realizing that God had shut the ark up? It wasn't even Noah that it was. God shut it up. And I, I have a deep conviction why God shut it up. Because maybe Noah would be outside going, oh man, I gotta let these people in. That's Sally. I know Sally, right? Yeah. Sally had a chance. This wasn't like, you know what? Gave you 24 hours. It's like, you know, the Black Friday sale. You gotta buy it right now. <laughs> this weekend's over and it's back up to some ridiculous price. 
It was, it was yeah. years and years and years and hundreds of years. Him sharing, I thought, yeah, yeah, crazy guy in the ark, yeah, I get it. <laughs> you imagine them banging on the ark. Mm. Let us in! Oh we believe now! Right. Yeah, but how many of us have had kids, they believe that you're going to do what you can do now after they've done it? Right, right. You, what? You really going to take the car away if I drive like that? <laughs> yeah. Because there are real consequences. I can't believe when I spent all that money. I can't believe when I did all this. You know, I heard a great analogy. If you don't brush your teeth, they won't follow tomorrow. Yeah. I know that. You know what? Even not next week, even months from now, you can even, I've, I know people, you didn't brush your teeth for a whole year, didn't fall out. Wow. One day, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna be eating something like a banana, whatever. <laughs> what the heck is this, right? <laughs> It's my tooth! What happened? <laughs> They're shot! Come on, David. I don't like flossing my teeth. Right. I don't like it. I do it every day. Because one of my dental hygienists, cheeky as she is, she's like, oh no, 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 no. Yes. You don't you don't have to floss your teeth. And I was like, what? 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 <laughs> wow. Are you single? I got a great person for you. Like, you're awesome. <laughs> what? And she goes, no, 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 only the ones you want to keep. And I was like, oh. <laughs> You're a bad person. You're, you're a bad person, I say. You're corrupt. <laughs> but the thing about it is, we get shocked when our teeth fall out. But we know how this happened. Daily. Gingivitis. Tooth decay. It's happening to you. You know what? I, I, brushed, I brushed October 16th, though. I know. I confessed my sin October 16th. It's all cleaned up now. I've only faced myself up. It's good now. I confessed at baptism. If I, if I do any more bad stuff, I'll let you know. But part of that is we look at the Bible. These people were running around like it's an ordinary day. Yeah. Come on. Good stuff. Today's an ordinary day. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, dude. I was thinking about this. At the wedding ceremony, I was like, yeah, I, I, it didn't get me completely down. I mean, Sean and Hazel were there. We were having a good time. But I said, you know, this is a great analogy to live in and, and, and to make it real. Mm -hmm. Your ordinary day is God's planning. You know, I've gotten more emails from people saying, do you think this is the last days? Mm -hmm. I don't know, let me check. <laughs> like, I don't know. I have no idea, yeah. right? There's the aliens everywhere and the UFOs and all this crazy stuff going on. I was like, I don't know. Right. The bottom line is I have no clue. Because the Bible's confusing. It says, You'll see the signs, and then you have no idea. Like, well, which is it, man? It's because you're going up and down right? you get, at the same time. God says, you'll come like a thief in the night. Thieves don't, hey, guess what? I'm going to rob your house tonight. That's yeah. not what it does. Yeah, right. But at the same time, you can see it like a woman giving birth. Like, That's pretty obvious a lot of times. Okay, yeah. hey, I've seen my wife. Amazing. Two kids. Mm -hmm. It was very obvious. She's having a baby. <laughs> but the Bible never cares about what day. It cares about us. Us being prepared. That's yeah. right. It doesn't matter what day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It'd be neat, you know, to, to have, you know, um, us get a clock. Mm -hmm. What do you think that would do if we got a clock mm -hmm. in the head? Mm -hmm. Two days, okay, well, about a day and a half to party, and then do whatever I want, and then that half day, I'm gonna go all Jesus. Mm -hmm. Go gangster hard on Jesus, I'm ready to go. <laughs> that doesn't test the heart yeah. at all. It, it, it doesn't help us with our hearts. Yeah. I'll tell you, man, can you imagine being an apostle, knowing full well that there's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and where is Jesus? Yeah. You'd be kind of discouraging. Can you imagine being told right now, Jesus is not coming back for another 2,000 years? From now? Then we get 4,000 something in our Gregorian calendar. A mother calendar would be like the year 9,000. <laughs> That's a long time, and oftentimes we keep. Forgetting that God's patience doesn't mean he forgets, he doesn't see, and he's weak. It doesn't mean that. It means he's patient, he's waiting. He's waiting for us to change and hopefully to grow. So there's two big things I wanted to be able to kind of land with this flood story. Because you can read the whole thing yourself, but once again, you can spend your whole life studying it. Go to the next slide, please. So discuss two important themes in the flood story that I want to highlight. There's hundreds of themes. But I want to highlight the first one. We, we, in our society, um, and I have multiple careers that I've done, um, you know, I'm a mental health therapist. I've been doing that since 2005. Mm -hmm. And I, I have been, um, you know, I work as a conflict mediator. Believe it or not, this is a, 
a time of transition for us as well. Um, I've been in Winnipeg along with my wife. We've been leading the church for 25 years. I've been in the ministry for 32 years. So a long, long time. We've gone through ups and downs, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Come on, David. And um, just watching our kids become disciples, watching the Winnipeg church grow, watching parts of the Toronto church, and even serving Hamilton. Yeah. And, and we've, we've done many things over the years. You know, and I'll tell you, one of the biggest things that's opposite of Christianity in so many ways is that the world, the number one thing the world values is freedom and autonomy. Yeah. The freedom to choose yeah. what gender someone is. The freedom to choose who and what, how do you end the life. The freedom to choose how to spend. You take someone's freedom away, yeah. they will freak out. Yeah. Absolutely. Passages like slave in the Bible, doulos, is changed to servant. Mm. Right? And now it's back to, you know, I mean, the servant, well, I can tip the servant. We had a lot of people serving us yesterday. But to have slaves, oh, we can't have slaves. But meanwhile, the Bible gives us a choice. Bad choices in our mind, because it goes against our freedom. Right. Is that you can either be a slave to God or a slave to sin. No, 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 no. Let's erase that. Because one of our biggest problems is this freedom ultimately expresses itself as we want to be God. Mm. Think about how badly we get upset when we can't control something. Right? right? We know what we're really saying. How come this weather is so bad? Why can't I be God? Mm. And change it the way I want. Let's stop the rain and cause drought all around the farmlands everywhere so I can have my picnic. Wow. I mean, think about that, right? You ever see that movie, uh, you know, God Almighty or Bruce Almighty? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Jim Carrey, I mean, you know, he said yes to all the lottery. Money. Everybody gets whatever they want. And so everyone won like 32 cents in the lottery. Everyone's getting yeah. mad, right? There's no boundaries. And when people get upset, it's because they don't get to control yeah. the world around them. Yeah. Yeah. Another time we get upset is, Look at me. I want attention. Yeah. Look what I'm doing. I want to post the food that I'm eating so you know how awesome I am, even though I can cook it. I mean, I do any of that. Like, think about all, I'm not saying don't post food. Everyone's like, oh, gee, I post food all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this is the complete me generation. You know where that comes from? Yeah. I want to be noticed. And sadly, the corrupt version of that, I want to be worshipped. Yeah. Think about I want to be in control. I want to be worshipped. Does that sort of sound familiar? Like, wait a minute. There's only one being that happens to you. He gets the control and he gets to be worshipped. But what about me? And so we call that freedom without God. A lot of this new generation of young people that I work with, one of the careers I'm going to move into, I have moved into, some workplace organizational health consultant with a specific focus on conflict mediation. And a lot of times... They have a lot of conflict between some of the older folks that work there and some of the younger folks that work there. Some of the younger folks come on in and it's like, you know, I want uh, 80,000 a year. I have no experience. <laughs> I got a degree, right? And also, my mom and dad told me I'm awesome. So I want seven weeks paid vacation. Mental health days, non-mental health days. I want all that. And all the older people are like, ah, what? When I started, yeah. you know, we had to work in the morning and the evening. The only time we got was to go to the bathroom. And that was <laughs> unpaid. Like, yeah. you know, all the stories begin, right? right. And there's huge conflict there. And as I started thinking about what this means for us as disciples, it comes into the church too. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And they want freedom without earning it. They want freedom and autonomy without any consequence to what goes on. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing is we share about freedom without God. Here's a scary, scary thing. You turn to the next slide, please. Listen to Genesis chapter 6, verse 7. Because what did these people want? They wanted freedom. They wanted to sin up a storm. They wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. And God called that corruption. You know what? In the end, if you know that if you're autonomous and you live life the way you want to live, and the, you want to be noticed and worshipped all the time, that's a lot of times, that's a lot of the source of mental health issues, of yeah. depression and anxiety. Yeah. Get anxious because I can't control stuff. Yeah. And meanwhile, here's the illusion. You were never in control in the first right, place. Right? right? And also, no, not everybody's going to notice you all the time. Yeah. Think about Do you know who your great-great-great-grandfather is? You don't know their name, huh? But they were at a wedding at one point, got married to somebody, got married to somebody, somehow popped you out, right? <laughs> but you don't remember who they are. You see, nobody, like, you disappear so quickly. Think about someone you absolutely love. 
You used to think about them every single day, now they're gone. You think about them maybe once a week, but over time they go. No, it's pretty different with me. You can put a monument up. A lot of times you see all these monuments. Who's that? They're in the way. Why don't they get out of the way and get some lanes of traffic? I mean, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So all these people want to be remembered. They want to be in control. In the end, it's going to destroy you. And God says, you know, you want that? Are you sure you want that? Are you sure, sure, sure? Mm -hmm. And here's the scariest thing. I'll give it to you. Right. What? What do you mean you'll give it to us? And we're like, yay! <laughs> no. If God gives us what we want, okay. think of all the scary things God hasn't given you. Yeah. And you're like, amen. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Are you married to the person you prayed for? Thank God. No, no, no. <laughs> Bad person. <laughs> there are many things that you wanted that God says no. But if you keep saying yes, yes, yes. So these people were on their way to flooding themselves with all kinds of destruction already. And to save those who are righteous, to save those who wanted to be with God. Yeah. This is what God does. I will wipe mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth, men and animals, and creatures that move along the ground, and the birds of the air, for I'm grieved that I made them. And so you start thinking about, what do I wish for? What do I really want? Everybody who's a Christian here, they say, what do you want? You're going to say, well, I want to glorify God, Dave. I want to do this, 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 this. What's your schedule look like? Where do you spend your money? Where do you spend your energy? Go on. But I really want that. Listen, I know people who want to say that they want to be married. I've done marriage therapy for years and years. But their whole entire life and schedule is a selfish way to live. And the other person seems to not to like that for some strange reason. <laughs> it's not about what I know. It's that space between what I know and what I say and what I do. So God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you. I'm going to give you what you want. We think that's a joyous thing because when we have freedom without God, we're excited about the freedom without realizing that freedom is going to lead you somewhere. You know, can you imagine somebody giving you the most scrumptious, amazing meal? Just think of your amazing meal that you want. The drink that you want, the steak or whatever, maybe if you're vegan, some, some, some tofu stuff, that you'll, whatever it is. Like, this is your meal. You love it. You're free to have it, and it's zero cost to you. Except you're on death row. And that's your last meal. You're like, oh, wait, David. Uh, that's, that's not going to taste the same because it's my last meal. Well, all these amazing things, but if the after part is not exciting, you don't want that. I don't know, like, oh, I want 12 buckets of chickens. Well, I, I guess why you order that, because it takes a while to eat it, right? I think they give you a time limit. But if you ever look up on the internet, the last meals of people on death row, you see some of those meals, if you didn't know it was their last meal. Yeah. Imagine, you have the freedom to get whatever you want, knowing full well, God says, oh, I'll give you one. I'll, I'll, wow. I'll give it to you. Turn to the next passage. Please. But David, that's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, mm -hmm. in the book of Romans, one of the most beautiful books ever written by Paul, mm -hmm. he uses words again and again, and when they use it again and again, it just means it's emphasizing it. And there's this passage he uses in Romans chapter 1 where God responds to their desire for freedom. Mm -hmm. I want freedom. I don't care. And they're like, okay, is that what you want? Are you sure? So in the New Testament, in verses 24, 26, and 28, look at these three scary words, four scary words. God gave them over. I just give it to you. Is that what you want? I don't think he does it the first time around, but if you keep begging him, and asking for it. God says, but I told you, this is going to hurt you and kill you. I don't care. God's like, please, my son. Please, my daughter. Don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to, no, no, no. And God's like, okay, go for it. So the Bible says they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So we're not only... It's not only what we do, but we approve and allow and we're excited about what people are celebrating things. God says, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Why would you celebrate that? That only leads to death. Yeah. Absolutely. We like to catch the first bits of sin because it's fun. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, fun. Come on. A lot of, most sin is pretty fun yeah. at first. Yeah. Later on, you're like, oh, no, what happened? Overspending is super fun. Yay! <laughs> and you're like, what's going on here? Right? And then I used to know a brother, man, he was a debt collector. Nine to nine, they can call you. Nine in the morning to nine to nine. Oh, oh my God. 
man, the excuses people would give for spending money that they don't deny them. What are you talking about? They, they start with denial. No, not mine. Since your name on here, there's a picture of you buying stuff, right? <laughs> oh yeah? Well, you have tons of money anyway. That's not even the point. Yeah. <laughs> MasterCard's got some money. I know it's your money. At the end of the day, we spend our energy and our morals, we spend all this, and in the end, we're shocked when we get given over something. Yeah. I know. We start to resemble what we worship. Right. Money is a cold, hard, unfaithful mistress. You have it for a while. It's always running out of your pocket all the time. It, it, it's cold and hard because, you know, one day you're hot dog and another day you're dog food. Mm. It's how quickly it happens. <laughs> so quick. It's so quick because, and that's how money works. It's such a powerful thing. Money's not bad. But when we have freedom, God says, I will give it to you. You want to be there? I'll give it to you. Absolutely. You, you want freedom? You want to go sleep with that and do that? You want to watch that? Knock yourself out. Because there's a point in time your spirit's going to go quiet. Mm. Go, oh, I used to feel really bad when I do this. God's like, yeah, I know, that's scary. Yeah. We call that the hardening of the heart. Come on. So yeah. these folks were hardened, yeah. even in the New Testament. I'm sure it's different now. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you watch people, even ourselves, saying, how could they do that? It so didn't true. start overnight. So true. It's a desire of where we're headed. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be part of church? You'll be here for a long time before you suddenly not be part of church. Yeah. You don't want a fellowship? You'll be here a long time before you figure that out. No one suddenly cheats on their wife. That's not how it works. I've been doing this for a long, long time. Yeah. It started somewhere where you decided that she's not my number one anymore. She might yeah. be 1.2. Mm. Eventually, it moves on to two. And then something. You're, you're a person waiting for an opportunity. Right. And it just happens. You're waiting to be free. Because you want to be free without God. And so I started thinking about this. Wow, why would God do that? Mm. Do you get a sense? God's not angry. He's sad. Don't do that. It's not like he's this cosmic old man. You know what? Everything that begins with the letter fun, I'm going to take it away. <laughs> God says, no, this fun stuff is going to destroy you. It's not, it, it just, it's called fun. It's because it's, it's just fun for the moment. It's just the moment. It's like that last tasty meal, but you're going to die after, mm. right? Oh, dude. Next passage. God doesn't do it out of anger. Mm. He's not this angry God sitting up on a hill. Are you those kids? Darn it. Like, that's not what he, he's like. He's sad as a father. And the Bible says the Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth. And his heart was filled with pain. Mm. Do you ever think hurt of hurting God's feelings? That's kind of weird, huh? Mm. I love it when couples fight. <laughs> and they're fighting. And they make up. And they're disciples, and they make up, and they're all kissy, lovey-dovey. That's kind of like if you came over to my house and had a big fight with your wife or husband, and you wrecked my house. And then you just hug each other and walk off on the sun and say, oh, we're so good with each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what about my house? Yeah. <laughs> right? You're like, oh, well, we're all good. We're reconciled now. But what about my house? Mm -hmm. What about my feelings? Mm -hmm. right. I always talk to couples and say, look, if you don't apologize to God after you fight. Your focus is you two. Right. That's it. Yeah. Not Christians, they can do that all day long. Disciples, the first person we hurt is God's feelings. Yeah. We really do. And he knows the fight long before it happens. Yeah. Even brothers and sisters' households, we fight and fight and fight. We wreck the house. We don't realize yeah. that that wrecking of the house it reminds God that why his son had to die. Yeah. Why his son had to die. It's not just a Focus of me getting along with everybody and I'm good in the good in the hood and we call it everything's all good. Meanwhile, God's like, look, right? I'm part of this because I'm I'm filling you with my spirit. Mm -hmm. And you are fighting and attacking each other. And now my heart's wounded and you walk away going having an ice cream and think you're awesome. Mm -hmm. See, it's a reflection of God's heart to save the righteous. And to grieve for those who are not righteous. It's not this angry space that we're thinking he's from. I'm not saying he doesn't get angry. But the emotion in his heart was sadness mm -hmm. and pain. Because he tells us, please don't do that. Yeah. And once again, we're not talking about the evil that we call evil. It's evil according to God. The Bible says we're righteous in God's sight. There's a big difference between righteous and my sight. And as we go through the next passage, we start thinking about what this means. That's freedom without God. This is what it looks like. God wants to have freedom with him. Yeah. So this is the next idea. 
the first big idea is freedom without God. We, we, we see it. Who doesn't want that? Nobody wants that. But once again, is it a thinking thing? I don't want that. That's just silly. But then we walk off and do the very thing we say we won't do because what we said and what we think is not going to change us. It's shaping what we want. What I want will trump everything that I think. What I want will trump a price tag any single time. You walk into a store and never says this, we've got thousands left. So you can take your time and buy it later when it goes on sale. It never says that. It says, you know, this is the best burger in town. This is the, oh, this is the 82nd best burger in Hamilton. Who's going to buy that in an 82nd burger? Who wants that? It's always the best. The most number one thing. You know why? It's not activating your brain. It's activating your heart. Right? Imagine coming, hey, Jazz, listen, I like you and Vernon. Great family. I could probably lose my job for doing this, but look, if you sign right now, I'm going to give you 30% off. I don't do this for anybody. <laughs> at, at, at level 40. I don't do this for anybody, okay? But please sign right now. You're going to always return it. Nobody wants to return it because of the awkwardness of looking at the person. Oh, why are you returning it? You know, like that, right? Because you're poking at your emotions, right? Is the iPhone 15 that nah, different than the iPhone 14? Oh, oh, so different. So different. You need one. Even though Apple may say, well, there's some slight shifts and things like that in price, and it's near Christmas. You know, yeah. you need to get one because you're a bad person <laughs> if you don't have one of those, right? If you don't get with your kids, what kind of loser parent are you not to get them a $2,000 phone that they <laughs> throw against the wall and leave around lying in a playground? Like, what kind of parent are you? That's a small vehicle in some places, right? Yeah. And so as we start thinking of what this is, we want freedom with God. We push past what we think we want and to see what we actually want. So we turn to this next passage. The cool thing about seeing those who want freedom without God, God is so cool, he notices the righteous. Sometimes we walk around at workplaces, we only catch people doing bad. Did you ever just, you know, maybe you're a kid, you go, yeah, my dad and mom, they only saw what I was doing bad. Can you imagine running around the workplace as a boss, or as a leader, catching people doing good? Hey you, what are you doing right now? Uh, I'm just like, you know what, I have to tell you how awesome you are. Aww. God sees the righteous. And the Bible says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Can you imagine seeing the whole corrupt world around, seeing their hearts, and you found Noah, said, you know what, thank you. You're awesome. And he just kind of did his thing. He didn't, he didn't know. He got, look at me, I'm the only one. He was probably living his life, doing what he needed to do, holding on. And the Bible says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He walked with God. And the cool thing about Noah, his name, Noah, it means rest. Mm. So in a cool way, God found rest in Noah. Look in his eyes. So you're looking at the, that guy gives me rest. Can you imagine looking at the whole world? Ah, I can't look. I can't look at this place. <gasps> There's one guy. He gave me rest. And Noah would go on to be the one that would give others rest. Even though the crazy thing was, Noah would be in the ark where you can find rest on top of a tumultuous flood with all these bodies banging into it. And it's just crazy. It's kind of like a big joke, you know, where, where people would hear that and say, wow, you find rest on top of the most violent, destructive time in history. Kind of neat. As we move on to the next passage, God doesn't just say, you got a problem. That's your problem. You suck. All you people are terrible. The professional language sounds like this. Well, I think that lies in the responsibility of your purview, of your work. And that's another way it's such a you problem. God always gives a way out. So if you're feeling like, you know what, I think I'm getting irritated because those comments of living without God and freedom resemble me a little bit. And God says, well, that's great. At least you know it. Right? And the Bible says, gives Noah this way out, but it's a wacky, crazy way out. He says, so go make yourself an ark out of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. So of course, what Noah did was he went to the nearest lumber store, right? Got himself some sealant and pitch and all that. No, can you imagine saying, you gotta, what? what? How big is this thing? But that, but that, but that is a fault. Like I gotta go chop all that down? Do you ever chop wood? It is not fun. 
It is not fun. Your hands don't look good. Everything looks bad. You can cut your leg off. There's so many ways you can die. Okay, cutting wood. You've ever tried cutting wood? It's not fun. Can you imagine going, is there, is there a store? Because no, there's no store. You gotta cut it all down. Can you imagine getting your friends and family, hey, I know you guys got some plans for the next 100 years, but look, we gotta go do something. Dad, are you nuts? Like, what's happening? Are you insane? Imagine one of his kids wasn't married. Yeah, you're gonna have to tell your husband that's what we're gonna be doing, you know, for the next little while. I mean, it's so faithful and costly to do that. What do we gotta do? Some of the things that we have to do to be a disciple, to become a disciple. Ronnie was sharing a little bit about her history. It's nowhere near as wacky as this. But what did you build? You know, you study the Bible, you pet, break up with somebody, do your thing, quit smoking, drugs, whatever you need to do. Did you have to go build an ark that's never been somewhere in the desert? Getting a whole bunch of wood? Having people make fun of you all day, like, hey, Noah, how's it going, buddy? Need some more pigs for your ark? I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your kids would have gone up to you like, Dad, I'm making fun of me at school. Yeah. Call me boat boy now. Like, how are you laughing? <laughs> and we, we don't like people making fun of us, but I'm telling you, when people start making fun of our kids, yeah. and can you imagine these yeah. kids, yeah, I know, kids, okay, a little hard, but we're getting back on the ark. There's probably maybe some neighbors, some good hearted ones. Yeah, I'll help you out. Maybe you see how crazy you are. It might be time to decide to quit. This church is an ark. It's a place. It's a place for us. And as wacky as you think it seems to be part of this ark, can you imagine the people that worked with Noah watching him that day? But that was God's way out. He doesn't want to give us some, you know, some way where it just makes sense. It's faithful. It's a faithful way. So if you're getting a really hard time staying faithful, freedom in God, just think about our forefather before us. What a principle to follow. Mm -hmm. You have not done anything as wacky as that. That is a wacky thing to do. There's no story about how David gave up his smoking habit. What a great story for Kingdom Kids. Yeah. It's not that at all. It's Noah built the ark. And then we twisted it and sanitized it. You know, the cool thing about it is we, as we come in for a close, if you can turn to First Peter, even when Peter wrote this, he referenced this amazing connection between the flood and the ark and our own salvation mm -hmm. for today. The Bible says in this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of the dirt from the body, but a pledge of a good conscience toward God. Mm -hmm. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we, what we do is we call, it, we call this a pious bias. I don't want you to think of that you don't know anything about Jesus. Let me tell you a cool story, okay? I am going to sacrifice my life for a guy that was born in a barn. Okay, I went, unwed teenage mother gave birth, and he's going to heal the sick, raise the dead, change water to wine, do all kinds of cool stuff, and yeah, and there's no proof of it. And there's angels that no one saw, and all that hung around was a bunch of shepherds. Want to follow? Wow. What kind of wacky story is that? But now, outside there's all these nativity scenes, all these, oh, you know, Mary, all, it looks so normal and cool to us, but someone who's never heard that, what a wacky story. Yeah. What a wacky story. There's other way cooler religious stories. Yeah. Marduk came on high and slayed the dragon Tiamat. And Tiamat's body parts lay all around the world. And then the world was formed from a wow. <laughs> Zeus got upset and prayed into somebody, made some humans. Wow. As opposed to Joseph ran for his life, wasn't even his father. Like, like just running around. We have not a powerful story. If I would have been a creation story, oh, whoa. It was so awesome. And all men and women bowed and their eyes blew up because they, you know. And I, I just, it's very strong. And everybody knew. And all of a sudden, symbols came across their forehead. It says, follow me every day. And those who did not, they would blow up just to show people, I'm God. I mean, wow. But nope. Running around for his first little bit of childhood, being chased by some crazy, insecure emperor. Being protected once again by, by donkeys and shepherds, the great fighters that they are. It's insanity. It's insanity of a story. And the Bible says, for us to believe this and follow this, when people look at you and you think they're, you're crazy, maybe you are. But crazy like a Christian. And some of us, we've stopped looking crazy because we look more like the world. We look more like the people that are going to be destroyed. 
So at the end of the day, this very faithful and costly commitment to get baptized. So as we close, we need to align with our story. Next slide. If you really need to take an honest assessment of our story, the story you're living now, is it with or without God? It can be asked of the church. It can be asked. I find there's parts of me, boy, I gotta align. Because if I don't align this with God, I don't align some of this with God, guess what's gonna happen? At the end of the day, I'm gonna be living my life, doing my thing. Thank and I'm telling you, it's gonna really, really challenge me when I get shocked and surprised. And so, as we close today, I just wanna thank the Hamilton Church for just taking the time to listen. Amen. Hopefully today's flood story um, gives you some principles to think about, some passages to consider, and to think about how this can be made personally done in my life, and how that's going to be practical in my life, even starting today. What's my next step? What's my next move? Is there somebody I need to talk to? Maybe somebody I need to open up about? Something I need to kind of realign my schedule, thinking, you know, I've been hanging around, living like the rest of the world, and somehow I think I'm going to magically appear in the ark without having to go there. It doesn't make any sense. I'm suddenly going to be a Christian. And those crack up when I see these, 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 these funerals of people who died in shootouts with cops, right? Yeah, they died in a shootout, but you know, everybody makes mistakes, you know, but they're in heaven now with Jesus. You're like, their trajectory is to be a hardcore gangster. And all of a sudden, like, they pop in heaven? Like, that's ridiculous. All of a sudden, I'm an uncommitted Christian that goes to church. I'm uncommitted to God. I'm committed to everything. We, I haven't read my Bible in years and weeks, and I've got sin all over the place. But all of a sudden, when I die... I'm in heaven. Hey, God, here I am. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah, here you are. We got a whole conversation for you. I'd rather hear it happen here on earth before the rain stops. Amen. Amen. So thank you so much, Hamilton. Amen. I appreciate your time.